My name is Pierre Cartier. I'm from the French Reference Center for Pediatric Rheumatic Diseases, RACE, and I will speak about recent advances in the treatment of polyarticular and systemic juvenile idiopathic arthritis. These are my disclosures. So GIA is a group of disease which starts before the age of 16 and until recently is considered to last at least six weeks with no other diagnosis found and arthritis. The ongoing classification is a bit complex with seven subgroups as you see here. At the moment there is an effort to validate a new classification that should be easier to understand with only four main groups plus unclassified diseases. Systemic GIA, which is Steele's disease, rheumatic factor positive and CCP positive polyarticular GIA like rheumatic arthritis, spondy arthritis in children, and a group of diseases that starts its early childhood with ANA positivity oligo or polyarticular onset GIA starting before the age of six years with a risk of chronic anterior uveitis. Other GIA will be considered as not undifferentiated GIAs. The main principle regarding GI therapy is the implement of treat to target therapy as I will strategy as we will describe to better take into account the need to actively control and quickly control this activity aim to reach inactive disease without steroids and take into account better parents' patient opinion being in line with expert recommendations or authorizations from the public health authorities. I start briefly with anthesitis related arthritis or spinal arthritis, which is here, as you say, is the same problem as in adults basically, starts in uh, children over the age of six or eight usually. And as in adults, we have mainly TNF alpha antagonists available in children set and Adelimab, and other ones awaiting validation such as Golimumab, and also uh, trials with other biologics such as IL-17 inhibitors in children, one of them awaiting authorization in France, and jac inhibitors. So we hope to have a broader spectrum of available drugs in these patients. So erratic GIA will disappear from zone classifications, however, there are some priorities from this disease, also before the age of six, it usually has the same outcome of oligo GIAs and after the age of six most, of, most often as ERAs. Having said that, there are many ongoing trials with 17 inhibitors, JAK inhibitors, apremidas and so on in this particular form of GIA. In patients with polyarticular GIA and who do not respond well to methotrexate or are intolerant to methotrexate, there are now several options. For quite a long time we had detanacent and adalimumab available Golimumab is also awaiting authorization in France in this situation. We had, have had for quite a long time tocilizumab, IV and now subcut in these children and we should soon have sarilimumab as well. And we have abatacept, IV and for a shorter time subcut available also in these patients. Tofacitinib is awaiting French authorization and baricitinib is uh, to be presented at the ULR for the first results of a phase three trial. What is very peculiar in children is the problem of these young children starting before the age of six, early onset oligo GIA with positive ANA antinuclear antibodies. These children, in addition to arthritis, they may develop eye disease, chronic uveitis. And this anterior uveitis is very chronic and without redness of the eye. So you may diagnose it too late to treat correctly unless, unlike on the right side of your screen, the so acute recurrent ear uh, uveitis, you see spinal arthritis. And the complications are devastating these children. They may develop cataract, glaucoma, macular edema, and other terrible complications. We don't diagnose on time this chronic anterior uveitis. So for this reason, we all recommend to have slit clamp examination every three months of the first five years of the disease to detect and diagnose in time and treat in time this terrible complication. There have been many, many recommendations published in UVITIS. I give you a few here, including the European SHARE initiative and the North American ACR recommendations. And in France, we had a group of experts, ophthalmologists, pediatricians, internal medicine specialists, rheumatologists, who issued recommendations also based on what had been done by others with the FAE2R and SENSEN rare disease networks. 
the main objectives is to control inflammation as quickly as possible, as early as possible, as long as possible, avoid complication of visual improvements, and avoid side effects of chronic active uitis and long-lasting steroid therapy. In particular, we don't want to have these children on long-lasting uh, steroid drops. If it's more than two drops over six months or more than three drops over three months, we really demand that systemic therapy should be discussed. Of course, if there is an underlying systemic disease, it has to be treated and you have to preserve patient's quality of life. Now, we know that we can use topical steroids in this anterior uveitis, that methotrexate may be useful as other uh, oil suppressive drugs. However, the main progresses are linked to target allergic treatments, as we will see, and this can be used either following recommendations from the health authorities, such as for adalimumab, or for expert o opinions if it's structured through our networks. There was a big English trials published, CKMR, that proved the efficacy of adalimumab against placebo, as shown here. Patients who had active UGI-associated uveitis on metrolexate and topical steroids were randomized either to receive adalimumab or placebo. And we saw that flares or uncontrol of uveitis was much more frequent in the placebo group than on adalimumab and therefore ADEMA was authorized in this indication. Also, the tolerance was acceptable. In addition to adalimumab, there is some experience with infliximab and golimumab and other TNF-alpha anti antibodies, but no published controlled trial. And there is some experience with the IL-6 inhibitor tocilizumab. However, one small trial did not meet its primary, primary endpoint. We know that it can be useful, particularly in children as adults with papillary edema. There is an ongoing trial with baricitinib, a JAK inhibitor. We don't know the results yet. We now move to systemic juvenile idiopathic arthritis, SGIA, which is a very peculiar disease, as in Steele's disease in adults. It's the same disease, basically, starting early in childhood, with spiking fever, skin rash, joint pain, muscle pain, sometimes pericarditis or myocarditis, and in few patients, early aggressive arthritis, in other arthritis can be delayed. And in some patients, also the risk of life-threatening macrophage activation syndrome. There are also here new diagnostic criteria ongoing validation, in particular to be able to diagnose earlier the disease after two or three weeks of disease activity, not waiting for six weeks, in order to treat these patients earlier efficiently. And the main recent therapeutic advances are not only with IL-1 and IL-6 blockers, as we know, but also JAK inhibitors, in some situation, gamma interferon antibodies for some, like macroaggression syndrome, and in few cases, other treatments, as we will see. And we'll also discuss treat target approach in this particular form of GIA. IL-1s inhibitors have been used at the early phase of the disease, as we will see, and also in patients with long-lasting disease, but mainly patients with not too diffuse polyarthritis. The randomized trials performed were either in patients at the early stage but not so early, and patients with persistent fever, inflammation, and arthritis. More recently, three to target approaches have been proposed in this disease. And the most interesting effort came from the German colleagues who said that it's important that you all agree to control this activity and fever very, very quickly. Within seven days, we want to have no more fever and a low CRP. Within four weeks, we want to have an improvement of at least 50% of medical assessment of this activity and the number of active joints, or a JDAS score low enough. And within six or 12 months, we want to have inactive disease of steroids or on very low dose steroids, which is quite interesting to try to achieve these goals in a child with recent onset GI SGIA. It might be more challenging in a child with long-lasting disease. Clinical remission is, of course, the dream we all want to achieve in these patients, which means remission and no activities that is sustained for several months. Dutch colleagues showed that treating patients at the very early stage of the disease without steroids with the IL-1 inhibitor anakinra resulted in a very high percentage of responders, and this response lasted over five years in most patients while stopping anakinra and having, in most of them, no steroids at all. So it's very interesting. However, there was no control group, and we don't know exactly if the proportion of this patient would anyway have a monophasic cycle course of the disease and those who had have a chronic course. So we don't know if the hypothesis of a window of opportunity to treat these patients is really uh, valid. With the anti-IL-1 antibody canicumab, 
response rates in the phase three trials was also very high. And this was in patients with in average two years desideration at trial entry, but with fever and arthritis. And what is interesting is that this patient responded well, and once after a few months as randomized to receive placebo canicumab, there was there were more flares on placebo which showed the interest of continuing this treatment in these patients. Having said that, what is also interesting with IL-1 blockers, if you treat patients with fever, we saw that if you want to be a good responder on the medium term, you need to be a quick responder. As you see here, the patients for the first two lines who had a very good or an excellent response after 15 days were also good responders after four months. By contrast, patients with low response rates after 15 days were not good responders after five months. So basically, if a patient doesn't respond quick and well, there is no need to continue this treatment, at least in those treated stage they had still high fever. In patients with just arthritis, you may have to wait a bit longer to decide if the treatment works or not. Can we be flexible in using these treatments on the long term? With canakinumab, there was an interesting effort to see if patients achieving remission on drug with no more steroids or methotrexate could be randomized to either taper treatment intensity by reducing the amount of drug injected at each injection every four weeks or by doing less frequent injections. And so, by 24 weeks phases, they moved to 4 to 2 and then 1 milligram per kilo and then nothing, or to injections every 4 and every 8 and every 12 weeks and nothing. And doing so, we could show that patients would maintain inactive disease on much lower dose or much less frequent injections, as you see here, even the second phase, when they had injections every 12 weeks or only 1 milligram per kilo per injection every 4 weeks, most of them would maintain inactive disease. However, following drug withdrawal, most patients would flare in the following six months. So unlike the Dutch experience, where children were treated at a very early stage, here, these patients, they seemed to need some long-term IL-1 blockade to maintain clinical remission in most cases. With IL-6 blockers, the experience is not so much at the early stage of the disease, but at later stage, with good results, even in patients who fail to respond properly or escape to IL-1 blockers or, or other drugs. But we still have the problem of some SGI patients with very severe disease, early onset, recurrent relapsing macrophage activation syndrome, often very high IL-18 levels and IL-1 levels permanently. And these patients are prone to develop severe disease, severe lung involvement, and die in many cases quite young. So we don't know yet exactly how to treat them. We are a bit worried about these patients. We don't know if the fact that we use less steroids at the early phase of the disease might be responsible for this, or if environmental factors we don't know are responsible for this uh, phenotype. And we still discuss what is the best treatment option. In general, in severe SGIA, IL-1 and IL-6 blockers remain the main tools. In some cases, we all use all drugs that are salidomide, but it's quite toxic. We have some hope in a few cases with other inhibitors, such as IL-18 or possibly by clona IL-1, IL-18 inhibitors in the future. And one of the main hopes is to use JAK inhibitors because these drugs, they might be active on systemic GIA and on the risk of macrophage activation syndrome. We don't know yet if they could prevent the bad outcome of those patients prone to develop lung disease. There is an ongoing trial with baricitinib and there has been a trial with sofacitinib that should, there is an ongoing trial with tofacitinib as well, so two JAK inhibitors and an ongoing trial with emapalumab and from gamma treatment in patients with MAS. In a few selected cases, we have to discuss very intensive treatments such as allogenic bone marrow transplantation to avoid a bad outcome. Not to forget, we discussed the therapeutic options in GIA regarding drugs, but we also have other important parts of the treatment, including physiotherapy, in some cases surgery, and of course psychological support, psych parents, and patients' involvement through therapeutic education and the role of associations is important as well. Thank you for your attention.